hello everybody. I, I, I love it that you all came here to this particular panel because these three people are fabulous. They're, they're wonderful writers, they're, they're very interesting people. You'll learn a lot about the island reading their books. Um, I will say three biographical things, or maybe the one biographical thing about each of them. Cherie's daughter is getting married in Sconset tomorrow. <laughs> a little break. <laughs> Blue has won both the Agatha and the Edgar Mystery Awards for her books. And if you know what those are, that's, that's like, she should be wearing a crown. It's, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> And if you look at her bio online, which is what I did, I brought it here and I thought, if I read it, then the, the panel will be done because she's published so many books. There are movies being made from her books. Her books are young adult books, but I buy them and read them. I think I probably bought 10 copies of Chasing Vermeer and gave them to everybody I knew. And her new book, um, Out of the Wild Night, is, is brilliant, and it's about Nantucket. And Stephen, about whom I could say many things, because I've lived on the island for 35 years, uh, but I will just say I learned something completely new from him, which is, did you know there are cockfights on Nantucket, on this idyllic island? Um, so we can all learn something no matter how old we get. So what I'd love to do is for each writer to talk briefly about the latest book, because they've all written several books, and what, what inspired them to write the book. So I, I'll start with Cherie. Well, I'm in talking about mystery here, I'm a little bit the odd one out because I'm the nonfiction writer. And I didn't start out to write mystery. The book is Diving for Starfish, the Actress, the Heiress, and one of the world's most alluring pieces of jewelry. Um, I went out to, to, as a reporter, learn more about these and found that I was in the mystery trying to get the information. So that was how it became a, a mystery. Of my four books, it was the only one in first person. Um, so Diving for Starfish was really really a story told through objects, although you're always writing, or I'm always writing about people. So it was really talking about the people who owned these pieces and had dealt them in the jewelry business and handed them off. And so that is Diving for Starfish, which came out a year ago. Can you describe? Can you describe? Yes, it's important to know a Boba. Boba is the name of the maker in Paris in the 1930s. Made three ruby and amethyst starfish brooches the size of the palm of my hand, and they were articulated. So a woman could. They have hinges, so you could put them on your shoulder, in your bosom, on a belt, and they became. They were very attractive to stylish, flamboyant women. There were only three, maybe five. And it was finding where they had been um, that the book is about who owned them. A whole fascinating subworld, the jewelry dealers that moved this kind of jewelry, because jewelry is a very secretive world. Men have always passed wealth to mistresses through jewelry. So it became that kind of tale. But the Boisvert starfish is one of those few things that there are only three or four of them. And the way they were made in Paris they can't be made anymore. So it was about the jewelry and the people connected to the jewelry. Thank you. Blue. Fascinating. Um, my books all have begun early in my life. I, I think I'm a really strange kind of a writer because um, I always tell people my books are for age eight and up because they're about ideas that I love to think about, often that I've thought about for decades and decades. And that is certainly true for Out of the Wild Night, um, which came out last spring, but um, it's built around uh, Nantucket, real life 
and very, very big questions about um, the setting of Nantucket and what's to become of it, what we do with the place of the past in the present here, um, mostly in our old houses. Um, and it's also about really the biggest mysteries. I love to write about things I don't understand and that nobody understands. And I feel like it's at that moment when you're grappling with an idea, and this is true for kids too, um, always. If you're grappling with an idea that nobody has an answer or a definitive explanation for, then your brain is all there. It's like squeezing lemon juice on your brain. You're like, Oop! and you're, you're thinking in a different way. And in Out of the Wild, night, um, I do write about ghosts again. Um, in my 20s out here, I did many, many interviews, probably about 75, with people living on the island about real experiences they had had. I never tried to explain them. I just recorded them as oral history. And so ghosts and thinking about ghosts and what they might be has been a part of my life forever. So putting them into a work of fiction was something I wasn't brave enough to do until I was this old. Um, and it's a pretty wild book, I've got to say. And it, it surprised me as I was writing it. I didn't know where this book was going to take me. And then I realized, oh my gosh, when you're writing about ghosts, you're writing about death, but you're writing about life in death, and you're writing about issues that have popped up in cultures all over the world since written history began. So there is something there. And um, again, it's, in some ways, it's the biggest mystery I've ever tackled. This life, death, ghosts, not. I mean, it's just endless questions. And um, I love to give that to readers. OK. Um, years ago, I wrote a thriller called Paranoid. And I got an agent for it. And we ran it in the Beacon, actually. It ran in the summer, that summer, in the Beacon, the alternative to summer movies. Anyway, my agent said, well, you know, I hope you have a lot more of these lined up, because you're going to be the thriller guy now. And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, we're branding you as Mr. Thriller, you know, and I like, had nothing. I had nothing. Every idea I'd ever had for a thriller was in that book. <laughs> Going back to high school, I mean, that was it. I, I was like, I got nothing. Well, they didn't sell it anyway, but it's fun. I mention it because, you know, someone said to me the other day, like, how do you come up with stories on this tiny little island? You know, it's endless. This business about the cockfighting isn't one thing. Um, I have people come to me all the time who tell me these bizarre things. Like, my, my boss said to me the other day, oh, you should put an SOS party in your next book. And I was like... SOS, weep out of luck, is that when he's like, no, no, um, statute of limitations. The statute of limitations party, when, when the crime you didn't get caught for, the statute of limitations is up. <laughs> huge party. A bunch of his friends came here for a huge SO, SOL party. I love it. Okay, that's in the next book. But it's endless. I mean, it's like you couldn't keep up. I was at the dump, and the woman said to me, do you know where the dump was built on Indian burial ground? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? So, I mean, that's, I'm going to do a dump book, Nantucket, <laughs> Nantucket Wampum, maybe, I don't know, anyway, uh, so, okay, each of my books is a fantasy for me of some petty, childish, vindictive type thing. <laughs> my first book, I had a customer who stiffed everybody, I thought it would be funny if they all got together and killed him, that was one. Um, <laughs> the second book, I mean, let's bomb the Pops concert, I was, I was always fantasized about bombing the Pops concert. Um, <laughs> of course, Henry stops it from happening. Um, Nantucket Red Tickets, who hasn't wanted to, you know, rig the, the Red Tickets raffle? You know, always wanted to do that. Figure out how to do it. it. Takes three people. You'll have to read the book to find out how. Um, and then, oh, I wanted to sink a $90 million mega yacht. And that's what I did in Nantucket Grand. That was really satisfying. I met the um, <laughs> I met the captain, the, the ship's engineer. I actually went on race week to try to get on one of these boats. And it's been seventy dollars to get onto the dock, and it was just for like sailboats they wanted to sell. The actual motor yachts I wanted to get on. The guy was like, 
you know, so. But there was this fantastic guy, like, looked like Santa Claus in a, in a nautical uniform leaning against one of the boats. And I said, hey, could you talk to me for a minute? And we got into it. He took me into the, into the engine room and sh he showed me how to sink one of the boats. It was great. So I was like, a dozen ways to sink one of these bastards. I'll show you. And he gave me his sat phone number. I said, oh, can I mention you in the book? I'll, you know, I'll dedicate the book to you. He said, no! <laughs> do, not, do not ever mention me in the book. Anyway, so this book is a bit more personal. I, I have to be very careful about this, but let me just say that my wife's life and mine have crossed paths with um, various people. Uh, both of us having problems with the same person is sort of unusual. Um, uh, <laughs> and I had a sort of a grudge against an individual, and I thought, you know what I'd like to do? I'd just like to kill them. But of course, I can't do that. So or at least make them the villain of a book. So, I, uh, so this book I made, the person I really, really uh, didn't have much a good feeling for, I made them the villain, and Henry got to kill them. In self-defense, I hasten to add. Um, and in the book I'm writing now, my, my same boss who told me about the SOL, so he said, you know, Henry's too nice. He has no dark side. He doesn't do anything bad. He's not a drug addict. You know, you got to make him. You got to give him. So I decided I would have Henry actually kill someone in cold blood or try to, and not and be foiled in the act. So even though nobody got killed and there was no real consequences externally, he knows from now that he wanted to commit murder and was ready to do it. And that's that's about as dark as Henry's going to get. I'm not sure what he's going to do with that knowledge, but that's. That's the one I'm writing now. Anyway. So. I think I want to move my chair a little further away. <laughs> the, so now we know where Stephen gets his material. <laughs> I'm going to read something from the Wall Street Journal about Cherie's book, Diving for Starfish. It's part history, part journalism, part personal quest, filled with drama and intrigue, and peopled by characters worthy of the Maltese Falcon. Whoa. So my question is, how much of this required research, and I think you did some, some very thorough research, and how much of it required just sitting down and writing? And did you do like research and writing and so on? Well, um, all of my books, and certainly this one, are based on reporting. I mean, if someone really asked me to characterize myself stripped down to the bare essentials, I would say I'm a reporter. Um, now, when you're writing a book, however, you have to craft a story, but it all begins with the information. So there was a lot of research in terms of what you can learn in a library or in books and other things, but it was almost entirely reporting because again, the jewelry business, and I didn't know this when I started, um, it is very mysterious. People evade taxes. They um, avoid customs. Jewelry, this kind of jewelry that the Boisvin starfish was, um, is very, very secretive business. So I had to do a lot of reporting, and there was a point after I got into the story, and I thought, this is nice, these pretty pieces of jewelry. Um, I'll find out all the people that owned them. They were famous and glamorous. Claudette Colbert, the actress, Millicent Rogers, the heiress whom I had written a biography of before, um, and some and other actresses and people over the years. But when I hit that wall of people not wanting to talk to me, I had I was really had tested to see if I could first off find the meet the challenge to find people who would reveal something. The, it was further complicated because jewelers I didn't know this jewelers it's the their ethical code says they never reveal whom they sell to or whom they buy from. So right there that was a going to be a dead end. So I always had my ear to the ground trying to find out or have someone give me a little tip that then I would run after. So it was a lot of research and reporting to answer Nancy's question. I didn't start out thinking that this was going to be a mystery or anything. I, I love that review. Like the Maltese Falcon was great. I kept thinking, what's that character? Is it green? Who's the uh, character that plays it in the film? I guess that would be me. But um, it was then telling the story so it didn't become, I talked to this jeweler and I learned this, and it would be so 
expository or encyclopedic, but it wouldn't be fun to read. So that was when I decided the way to do this was to do it in first person, so that I got to take you, my reader, with me on these experiences with these fascinating, sometimes deceptive people. And so I could really take the, the reader, and that was where the suspense came from. And of course, as in any book, and we all know this, and I'm sure some of you are writers out there too, when you craft it, there's almost as much about what you pull out as what you leave in. And I had not been quite as aware until I wrote this book about the pacing of what you told at what moment, what information you left in. Because I don't really start writing until I almost have the whole story. Um, I actually did start sooner with this book because I didn't know exactly how I was gonna put it together. And I always feel about two thirds full, that pressure. It's like, when are you gonna start writing? Because I'll spend a year, year and a half doing just the reporting and organizing those notes. And I felt that pressure, when am I gonna get started here? So I didn't know exactly the ending when I started writing the book, and then there are things in the book, I won't give it all away, maybe we'll come to it later, that changed even after the book went to press because it was a story that kept evolving. Those pieces of jewelry changed hands again after I finished the book, so it was interesting. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. I read the book, and it is fascinating, and, it, and she went to Paris, talked to Paris jewelers. It wasn't just like Googling. On, on your computer. You did real research. So I did a little research because it was, what, 30 years ago that Blue published Nantucket Ghosts? Was it 30 years ago, about then? A little longer. Right? A little longer <laughs> than that. <laughs> well, she's written all these other books since then, and she's also taught um, elementary school. And she knows how children think. Um, and she knows Out of the Wild Night is from the point of view of children, but, but you just do it so well that, that it brings me back to my childhood. And it made me think of something that I want to ask you about. Um, there was a book called The Magical Child by Joseph Chilton Pierce that I read when my kids were little that said, children under seven are really close to the spirit world, to, the, to where they came from, to where they're going, and that you shouldn't teach your child to read before the age of seven, because that would interrupt this, this connection. So do you think children are magical in that way? Very interesting. I don't know about the book, and this is a different question than any I've ever gotten. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the great privileges um, in being able to work with children, the children I worked with were generally eight and nine. Um, the book Chasing Vermeer that I wrote, I wrote as a read aloud to them. It's really a book I wouldn't hand to a child who was under fifth or sixth grade, however. Um, and then, as I said before, um, I'm, I'm sort of a problem writer because um, my books are really for anybody who's curious about the issues in the books. So they don't fit publishers and marketers um, peg holes very neatly. So for instance, in Barnes and Noble, they were always having trouble. They were like, well, I want to put her here, but I want to put her there. And then they'd call Scholastic and they'd say, yeah, but adults are looking for her. So what do we do? So the American publishing industry is set up in such a way that they demand that you categorize yourself, which is always kind of a problem for me. Um, but children, um, I think, are, I have huge respect not only for their brain power, but their ability to knit disparate ideas and pieces of their own experience and of the real world as they know it in a way that's multidisciplinary. That's what they do. They haven't yet learned to put things into separate boxes. And when you box everything up the way we have to, as we move on through school and academia and the world, everybody's always asking us to categorize and sort and box things. You lose um, a lot of the magic in life. So um, I think 
part of me must still be eight years old, but I always love that feeling of reading a book that wipes out those borders and allows you to see the magical in the everyday um, and allows you to not really care whether it's real or not. I mean, what is real? Um, is an experience that can't be explained less real than one that can, that doesn't light your imagination? Um, these are questions that are, are fascinating and children don't worry about them. So um, it, it was really, really fun to start out working with kids in that way. And these are books I wouldn't have been able to write if I hadn't met so many young thinkers. And I was teaching in the University of Chicago community, which was heavenly, because I could be the weirdest of teachers. I mean, we did strange projects, and we investigated all kinds of things and got into trouble. They must um, have loved you so much. No, the kids. <laughs> the kids. It was fun, but I wanted to say to you too, my background is in art history, and what you're talking about in the, the world of gems and jewelry is so similar to the art world, which is rife with controversy, as controversy everybody and knows. Deception. And deception. theft and crime and passion of different kinds. You, you sort of forget that there are these pockets, I think. I mean, of course, ghosts are a different a whole different thing. But um, I think in, in these kinds of books, certainly when you're working on them, there is almost a period of disbelief. Now again, I, I'm a journalist, so I have to pin it on a fact, but I think even in good fiction, it's, it's based on something that could happen. But there's almost a period of disbelief that you, you have to grant yourself that childlike position to say, how does that work? And could I believe that? And would that happen, don't you think? And I, maybe that childlike position is really the most intelligent position because you haven't yet. You don't know it all. You haven't limited you your uh, sorting powers. You know, you're, yeah. sort of, you're wide open. I always think that's fascinating. And kids are great detectives, as everybody who's had a child knows. <laughs> How come you and Santa use the same Christmas wrapping paper? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> OK, Stephen, I have a question for you. Okay. And then I have a question for everybody. But this one is especially for Stephen. Okay. I'm reading his latest book, Nantucket Counterfeit. And all the chief kennis, all the chief. Chief Kenneth is chief of police in all five of his books. This is a series which is wonderful because it makes me feel comforted to know when I finish a book of an author I like, there are more books out there. And so keep writing. Oh. Good. But here's my question. Okay. Okay. Chief Kenneth has a girlfriend, a friend, who is the writer of mystery novels. What's her name? Jane Stiles. All right. Jane. And at some point in the book. Any relation to Anne Breeding is entirely intact. <laughs> um, at some point in the book, someone says to, I think it's Jane, maybe it's Chief Kinnis, well, if a person writes murder mysteries, ah, you know what I'm going to say. Does that mean you, the person who writes murder mysteries has thought about it, so that person is one step closer to being able to murder. Is that, did I, did I? Well, no, I would, I would, I would very much disagree with that. Uh, I've never thought of killing anyone. Never, I've never done. Let's call the cop here. No, um, I think it's the opposite. I think that people who think about this a lot, it sort of drains off, especially like there's an actual, you know, the, like the killing in the new book, it, it drained off all my animosities and I feel very, I feel very benign toward the living individual who I, whose avatar I killed in my book. Um, so I think that, yeah, I, I know Stephen King always gets that, like, you must be a really creepy guy. And he's like, no, you know, it's just, uh, I, I never really even th thought about writing mysteries. I mean, it's weird. It just, it sort of came about by accident. But what I like is not so much the murder aspect of it as the, the puzzle aspect of it. I like, I like the, the game you play with the reader where you set things up 
and you give them the evidence that they need, you know, and, and, and you're trying to trick them, but fairly, and they're trying to figure it out, but fairly. Um, it's difficult to construct a mystery. Yeah, that's actually. the hard, the structure is the hard part. And yeah. the hard part is really, the only really hard part is the little, the, the clues, basically, because they're the essence of the thing that, that, um, that you use to turn the, so it's like there's three stories going on at once, and only one of them is real. But they all have to be connected to each other and all believable. So you start with story one, and then that's refuted, and you go, oh. And then you're on story two, or maybe three and four, but the clues connect everything. And the, and the second book I wrote is about, <laughs> it's about someone being framed for framing someone else. <laughs> Why I got this idea, I don't know. But that meant that every clue had to work three different ways. Every clue had to point at one person, point at the person who was framing him, and then actually reveal the person who was concocting this crazy scheme in the first place. So um, those things are, I, I, it's funny, I was reading some, some detective writer, he said that he would check into a hotel in Paris because he wanted the mint on the pillow. He was all excited about the Georges Sank mint on the pillow or whatever. And uh, it was like a, like a Christmas mint, like a red and white striped Christmas mint. He's like, what happened to the chocolate mint? And the, the bellboy said, I don't know, that is only when you check in the evening, we have the chocolate mint, and in the daytime, we have this mint. And he was like, ah. See, a mystery writer goes, perfect. See, he's trying to convince them that he checked in at night, and he's talking about the mint, but it's the wrong mint. You know, you immediately go, yes, I'm going to use that. I, I, I could just see everyone, every mystery writer read that, but damn. You know, and now I've spoiled it. You're going to read whoever this guy's book is, and you're going to go, oh, it's the mint. Ha! But like, those kind of things, like I, my landlady is Ginger Andrews, and she always gives me fantastic information. And she told me about two years ago that there's a green snake that's only found on KOTU. And I'm like, OK, agree. Well, that means someone said they weren't on KOTU, and the green snake slithered out of their truck. Yes. You know? Another time, Ginger came in from Attica. She was dripping wet. She'd been birding. And I was, it was a sunny day. I was like, what happened to you? Did you walk into a sprinkler? She said, no, it was pouring rain in Attica. I was like, oh, there's another one. Because the guy was in Madiket, and, and he had the wet jacket, and didn't realize it wasn't raining on the rest of the island. So there's an alibi shot. And you just, your mind starts like spinning in this way. And it's fun. I, uh, Annie's reading um, this Irish mystery writer, Tana French. And she gets every one of Tana French. She's terrific. Yeah, but Annie gets every one. She's like, murderer, murderer, murderer. She just knows. You know, and it's, I don't know whether she's hooked into Tana French's mindset or something, but it's disappointing for her because, you know, when she reads Michael Connolly, who's my idol, she never figures out who Michael did in the Michael Connolly book. And she got Tana, she nailed Tana French every time. She only read four of them, but. Uh, so I like that. And I know some, like my, I know some, mostly women in their 60s and 70s who love my books who are like, you know, they like them. Well, I'm just saying, I don't know. My, my, uh, I know there's lots of, I would say my audience is mostly women from 30 to 70. I would say that's like, I don't think any man have ever read any of my books. I, <laughs> I don't know why not. I but, have uh, a question for both of you. Don't you think it's true that authors, particularly authors who write about mysteries, are very dangerous because they do have that side to them that picks up everything around you, that. like Lint. And you, you, in fact, you can't even stop doing it if you're that kind of a thinker. Yeah. And Nancy, you must have the same feel. So your fiction, fiction really isn't fiction. Fiction is really packed with secrets. I do have always. a thought of. I do have a thought about that, though, because like, there's always a question, can you write someone who's smarter than you, or funnier than you, or better than you? Can you, you, can, you can't write someone who's funnier than you, but you can write someone who's or maybe even, but you can write someone who's more observant than you are. I am the least observant person in the world. There's a scene in, what, I think it's in, in Grant, Henry goes into this guy's house and they walk past his kitchen and upstairs to his office upstairs. And Henry says, I really need to talk to your uh, roommate. And the guy says, I live alone. And he's like, <laughs> no you don't. And he's like, what are you talking about? There was a, a mug of coffee on the kitchen table and you have one, so who's that one? He says, Oh, I, sometimes I use two mugs, you know? Sometimes I use three mugs in the morning. What's the difference? No, Henry says, that one had milk in it. You drink it black. Well, you know? I think and I, like, I could never, I don't notice that there's coffee there. I wouldn't even know what house I'm in. But, but everybody writes about what they know. Yeah. And so I think whether that's fiction or nonfiction, but writers in general, you're always using information. Uh, when, when I lived in New York and was in some writers' groups, you had to be very careful 
what you discussed in those writers' groups because you didn't want it to show up in someone else's short story. Um, so I think you have to be careful whether it's it's fiction or nonfiction. We're we're sort of cannibals out there, uh, eating e even in nonfiction. Joan Didion says writers are always selling somebody out. That's true. And being the spouse or children of now that's also something to be very careful of. You, you've always got that, that husband you can reference, you know, who didn't like something and is your foil. And when your spouse is also a writer, careful. it gets a little tricky. You want to stay married, you have to be careful. My first book in 1986 was called Stump Motherhood, How to Survive. And it was interviews with women who were married, uh, men with children, and it talked about their experience in that role in family life, which in 1986 was, it wasn't quite as, broadly discussed and looked at. This was before all the talk shows and such. And I had to be, I did want to stay married. I had to be very careful in not telling too much about my marriage and stepchildren. So I interviewed 50 women to, to spread it around. I was a very sympathetic, <laughs> very sympathetic interviewer. And just in a Nantucket aside, I talked about that book actually at the Nantucket Yacht Club where there, I'm sure it's the national average, a lot of divorces. And I said, um, are there stepmothers in the audience? And almost no hands came up. And I wanted to have a newspaper where I would say, Yacht Club stepmothers in denial. Because nobody, <laughs> nobody wanted to, to say, oh, yes, that's my problem. That's my problem. Anyway, I sort of digressed, but it's all related. Yeah. It's all related. Anyway, I just, just to finish, I can, I'm not observant. I'm kind of an oblivious, mindless idiot. But, it, but it's like setting up a, you know that we see those guys um, in like sports channels where they set up this incredibly intricate pool shot where they clear the pool table with one shot. Well, it's taken seven hours to set that shot up, and then he does it in one second. That's me. You know, I set up the pool, and then I'm like, whoa, how could he do that? Well, you know, if you have enough time and and no one's watching, you can do a lot of stuff, you know? <laughs> like, doesn't mean you can actually, you know, you can actually do it yourself. Yeah, you can have great adventures writing these books. Oh, yeah. Um, my husband, Bill, has been amazing. He has um, traveled everywhere with me, sometimes in the middle of the night to places that are a little dangerous. And um, I find that you have to get in there and touch as much as you can and put yourself in the same place as your characters as much as you possibly can. I didn't jump from one roof to another or anything like that. But, but I did stand under the roof and look and figure it out and think, okay, if I were 11, could I make that jump? Or would I fall down the crack? What do you think, Bill? And Bill would say, well, mm, maybe. So that, yeah, I, I think um, you enter the book and the book enters you and this, there's something that happens when you're writing a book set in the real world that's really interesting and the settings and the details, and they become yours, and then you, you sort of enter into their whole path. Um, I don't know quite how to um, describe that, but it's a change that yeah. happens. It's a, sort of a metamorphosis. Well, and I always wonder in nonfiction about my job, so that I want it to be factual and it's reporting, but you, the reader, are, I'm your only connection, unless you work in the jewelry world or you know some of these people. Typically, I'm your only connection. So I feel a little bit obliged to interpret. Was this person genial? Do I trust them? Is there reason for my feeling that way? I think that there is a little bit of an interpreter role for the narrator. And sometimes you have to connect the dots. You can share what you think. Um, somebody was generous and you had every reason to trust them, someone you knew the facts before you went to interview them and they lied and they looked you right in the face. Um, I feel obliged to tell you that because you should know and it was startling to me and it's part of the story. It doesn't always make everybody happy in the end. But anyhow, back to the point, I think even when you're writing nonfiction, you have to give some of yourself away so that even if you're not putting it right out there, what you select to show and to tell is revealing of your perspective and where you come out on these people. Did you find them admirable? Were they entertaining? Was it plausible? It should be in there, because otherwise it's like a, a newspaper account, and, and that's not what you're looking for. 
I want to ask one more question. We have 10 more minutes, and then I want to see if the audience has any questions. So my last question to the three of you is, Blue and Stephen, in their recent, their latest books, um, aren't particularly happy about development on Nantucket. Um, and um, I don't know how you feel, Sheree, but you've, you're, you've been to this, you've lived here on the island for years and in Taos and New York and so on. But the island is changing and changing. Some of you have lived here. Some of you come here in the summer. And there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of change going on, a lot of beautiful old things being torn down and less beautiful things put up. And Stephen and Blue, can you talk about that a little bit in your books? Okay. Yes, you go. Um, yeah, I, I feel like our old wooden houses on this island are our gems. They're, they are jewels. They're, um, each house is unique. It belongs to another time, another place, and through an accident of history, many of them have survived. And um, to see the outsides are protected, the insides are not, as everyone knows. And to um, see that people are buying these houses and looking at the fact that there are no right angles and the floorboards might not quite meet and the house has its own geography, it goes up and down. Um, to see that people look at that and think, oh my gosh, what a piece of trash. I've got to straighten this out. Um, does really break my heart and also just have, it's all for me bound up with the ghost stories I've heard. Most of the stories I started hearing, you know, 40 years ago, um, take place inside old wooden buildings, not always inside, sometimes around them, sometimes in a newer house. But these houses are saturated with living and the people who lived on Nantucket and managed to survive here were people with strong spirits. And in some ways, I feel like it shouldn't be too surprising um, that there is something left over inside the walls of these houses. And anyone who has renovated really old buildings on Nantucket, anybody, any contractor, any painter, any carpenter, has stories about what sometimes happens when you go in and you start pulling out doors and old windows. And often the house suddenly seems to react. Doors slam, there are footsteps, <laughs> things tip over, strange things happen. And I do hear those stories because I'm sort of the ghost lady out here. It's safe to tell them to me, um, and I've heard so many. So the idea that these houses have layers of history, unpredictable human history in them, and they're all, each house is unique. Most of them were made by hand using, and sometimes reusing wood. They are sort of, I think about the frames on something like a Vermeer painting or a Da Vinci painting. Those frames are often really worn and battered. We would never think of taking that worn, battered wood off and throwing it out and putting a new piece of pine around a Da Vinci painting. So I wish we could see our old um, houses in the same way, so that see ourselves as stewards of these houses um, rather than the real owners. We're, the, these houses are um, to be protected. Well, you know, Kennedy wanted to make this place a national monument and, and freeze all of it. And it was Nantucketers who voted that down. You know, they didn't want to, it was a gold mine, they didn't want to lose it. This was like in the 70s. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to sort of write a his, my story of the island as it's changing. You know, that's like the real story under all the books, under the, whatever the mystery is. You know, and I have, you know, villains, real villains in my Heart, uh, you know, there's a reason why every almost every villain in one of my books is a rich person. You know, I've worked for dozens of them. I've, you know, I, I've, there's a, I've worked for hundreds of wealthy people, and I'm like six nice people. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
And a perfect example of what you're talking about, I won't mention any names, but there's a very notorious house near here um, where they completely gutted the inside of it. And, um, and the reason was because their faux antique furniture was too high for the ceilings of the house. So to fit their faux antique furniture into a real antique house, they had to destroy the entire inside of the house and raise the ceilings. Which to me, that's like Nantucket in a nutshell right now. But um, don't you think our job as writers is not so much to criticize? I mean, a lot of this is just the way the world is moving and we live in the United States and there are a few regulations to control that. But you can raise people's awareness, I'll maybe. try, I mean, get yeah. people angry. I'm really, it makes me angry. I posted a thing on Facebook today. I, I finally got to pick, find, figure out how to put the picture online of the hospital. You know, I, I, I hate to sound like an old crank, but there was really nothing wrong with the old hospital. You know, my mom was in there when she first came here, and she, she was like, what, she had a room the size of this room, practically, and there were, you know, a bunch of other rooms. No one was in them. You know, it's a tiny community. It's a lot of rich people want a plaque on the wall with their name on it. What, it's where you go into the waiting room. It's the the uh, Bill and Ignatz, whatever, Mr. Microsoft's waiting room. And it's like, really? Do we have to have your, you know, do you have to piss on everything to you know, state your territory? So, and now the old hospital is just like, you know, in rubble, you know, which is a building I loved. Uh, meant a lot to me, a lot of other people too. Um, I, I remember I was at a party with one of these, you know, toffs who had put a lot of money into it. It was like, oh, you took your life in your hands when you walked into that building. This is what they always say. That was the dreamland, too. You're taking your life in your hands when you walked into the dreamland. Really? I don't think so. I, I, it was perfectly safe. Anyway, so now there's this pile of rubble, and I took a picture of it, and I said, I always used to say, um, there's that bumper sticker I used to make fun of, and I would say, what's your hurry? You're already in Fallujah. Um, and it's like, now it looks like Fallujah. It looks like a huge rubble pile. And um, pretty soon it's going to be a parking lot. You know, there'll be no evidence. But and it's depressing to me. I have to interrupt you. Please do. Um, there is so much still to celebrate on Nantucket that is so exquisite and so rare and yeah. so so everyday but unique. You know, we, we are surrounded by beautiful things. Sometimes it's the paving stones, sometimes it's the bricks, sometimes it's the insides of these houses. This town is incredible. I ha sorry, I have, to, I have to interrupt everybody because we have to leave because there's another group coming in oh. here at, at 12. But I want to say um, all of their books are over there. You can buy them. You can have them signed for anyone you want. You can meet the authors, talk to them. Um, and uh, I want to thank Cherie and Blue and Stephen because first of all, for their wonderful books, which I, lo I love reading, but also for being so open about your craft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.